Muchísimas gracias, muy buenos días. Nuevamente gracias por su participación, a toda la audiencia que hoy nos acompañan en el marco de la vigésimo primera semana de posgrado en Baja California Sur. Les damos la cordial bienvenida a la presentación de la conferencia magistral Salud Integral, impartida por el doctor Todd Ojara de la Universidad de Texas. Continuamos presentando al doctor Ojara. Antes me permito leer una breve reseña curricular. El doctor Todd Ojara es médico veterinario graduado en la Universidad de Madison, Wisconsin, y es doctor en ciencias por la Facultad de Medicina de Virginia. Actualmente es jefe del Departamento de Biociencias Integrativas Veterinarias e investigador principal del programa de laboratorio bilingüe de toxicología BLT de la Universidad de Texas. Welcome, doctor Ojara. Please start. Good morning. I uh, just wanted to confirm that uh, we can see my PowerPoint presentation before I get started. Are we good? Yeah, you're good. Gracias. I, I am very uh, grateful and honored to be asked to start off today and uh, working with some of my colleagues there in Baja California, sir. We felt uh, One Health Perspectives might be a good topic to discuss. And if I'm going too fast or um, I'm using terms people don't understand, I'm, I'm hoping someone would jump in and uh, interrupt me and ask me to explain. Uh, that would be fine, but I'll try to go at a pace that hopefully um, everyone will be fine. My Spanish is not very good, so I apologize. I have to give this in English. And ironically, my laboratory is called the Bilingual Laboratory of Toxicology. That implies that I work with people who are bilingual. I don't necessarily have to be bilingual. And um, I think most of the people I work with understand that, that our work in Mexico uh, is important to be bilingual uh, for a lot of reasons. So thank you very much. Oh, the slide's not advancing. Let's see if it's slow. Let's just... Lo siento, uh, the slide's not advancing. There it goes, perfecto. Uh, the emphasis today will be on marine vertebrates as sentinels. And uh, that means marine ecosystems and human health. And again, uh, when I moved from Alaska to Texas, we decided to call the uh, laboratory the BLT, which for some of you who are familiar, that is also a bacon and lettuce tomato sandwich, which is also pretty good. And that was kind of the joke behind BLT. And again, we're emphasizing bilingual when I moved to Texas from Alaska. And Baja California, sir, and California in the USA are two of our places where being bilingual in, in Spanish is important. And in Alaska, we uh, have to be sensitive to different languages. There's multiple Alaska native languages that we have to uh, accommodate too. So we often have to have translators and interpreters with us in rural Alaska as well. So here's the connection. Many people wonder why I get to work in places that are considered resorts or for tourists. And it pretty much comes down to that we're connected by the ocean and the, and the Western North American coast. If you go from Northern Alaska all the way to Cabo, you'll find that many, many communities depend on the marine ecosystem and that this reliance is very similar even though it crosses languages, cultures, and different species. And so I've put some of the species up there uh, that going from the North to the South that sort of represent how people see them as uh, potential food, uh, also as top predators. And so a lot of the dynamics we talk about in health, especially One Health, relates to these uh, biological and ecological relationships that are very similar uh, all up and down the Western coast of North America. And hopefully by the end of this, you'll, you'll appreciate our One Health values and principles are pretty much the same. Todos Santos and La Paz are the places that um, we typically work in. 
the pause, of course, because there's many, many academic and research institutions in La Paz. Todos Santos is because I have colleagues with Colorado State University uh, that also work with us there. And so it's very nice to uh, be able to work in both of these communities and uh, with our colleagues from uh, Colorado State University and of course from Baja California Sur. And uh, just, I absolutely love it there. It's, it's gorgeous. And so it's a, it's a great place uh, to work because of the people, the environment and uh, the animals that we get to study. So I feel very privileged. So you all know La Paz Bay and uh, there's a cafe in Todos Santos where I would like to say how important um, the people of these communities and the colleagues are to doing One Health work, to doing our research. And so uh, it's so important to be community-based and we try to be as uh, community-based as possible. And as I go through this, you'll see that we work with uh, farmers, animal owners, fishers, and, and others uh, to try and better understand uh, one health in this region. So just absolutely love it there. And the people are fantastic to work with. This is Todos Santos. And for some of you, you may not be aware that Colorado State University actually built a campus there in Todos Santos, uh, right near this location where uh, many people go to work with fishermen. Um, Puntos Lobos, uh, I think I got that name correct. I always pronounce it incorrectly, sorry. But that's, these are important uh, community members to work with, the, uh, the fishermen. And so we, we really value Todos Santos in our, in our research, in our education. And there's a facility there that Colorado State built that we can do outreach and education at too. And that's, that's worked wonderfully. And we have colleagues uh, from this university that, that we directly work with. Um, so we're very uh, happy to do that. Dr. Fry is, is one of our main colleagues. She also has to teach vet students from Colorado as well in Baja, California, sir. Dr. Felipe is a very important colleague uh, for shark research along with the army of students he usually has. And uh, this is uh, in Todos Santos where we were working with uh, fishermen to get the appropriate data on sharks and to get uh, samples from them. And Dr. Felipe has uh, supported many, many graduate students with his relationships with these communities and his efforts in his lab. And I was invited in to, to help with some students uh, when we worked on toxicology. And you'll see uh, as we work through this presentation that some of this work that we work that we did with elasmobranchs and other fish has resulted in some human subjects work too that we've done collaborative collaboratively as well and so this is going to tie the one health themes together we can't forget about our companion animals as sentinels as well and we here at texas a m already take advantage of these opportunities where we have uh, what we call spay and neuter or maybe better sterilization of cats and dogs, where when clients or, or animals are brought in for spay or neuter, we sample them for infectious diseases. So we, we can use domestic animals as sentinels, and we'll talk a little bit about what sentinel means. So we don't mean to exclude these cute little adorable animals because they're important for understanding um, infectious disease agents in our homes and, and in our food supply. Uh, when we talk about livestock. So um, don't want to exclude them because they are very important. So here's Dr. Tanya. Uh, she uh, is a very active participant uh, with Colorado State University and she has her own program related to working with cats. And so these are very good opportunities to work with the community to obviously do the sterilization, but also to sample the animals for infectious disease agents, whether it's the antibodies in the serum or the actual agents themselves, like through PCR. And so we're doing this now in Texas and we're very focused on COVID-19. 
uh, of course, but we look at other agents, infectious agents as well. So I wanted to make sure people understood that when we have these large events, these are great opportunities to see what's in the uh, animal population that clearly people are exposed to. So um, wanted to promote sterilization of animals as well as saying there are great opportunities for other kind of work. Here's Dr. Tanya. She uh, helps me get out to these livestock operations with Dr. Fry, who's from Colorado State University. We decided to try some uh, new methods, new field methods to see how they would work. And so when Colorado State University went out to um, have their students work with these uh, producers, these farmers, ranchers, we were able to also uh, perform our studies. So it was education, outreach, and research all put together. And as you can tell by Dr. Tanya's uh, smile there, it was a lot of fun. We really enjoyed it. So most of you have seen the terrain, the geography. This is north of Todos Santos. There's a variety of animals uh, at these uh, ranches, these farms. And so we typically didn't sample these, but there are, this goes to show there's a mixture of animals at these places. And then here we are with Dr. Fry, and we're working with uh, vet students and, and the local farmers uh, to collect these uh, milk and blood samples for disease surveillance. And it looks like this is gonna be an increased effort uh, now with Colorado State University based on some recent discussions that are centered on One Health. So these are great opportunities for graduate students to work with very high tech methods and to work with a variety of investigators from around North America. Of course, just I just love the, the geography and the animals. It's just, I love it. So we'll get back to the marine component now. And uh, we often talk about the triad, uh, environment, agent, and host. And so this has always been the epidemiologic triad but we've now put one health in front of it to drive home the importance of the environment. We sometimes call it the abiotic, the non-biological, and then, and then we have the host populations, which would include invertebrates, vertebrates, and of course, people. And then we have the environmental agents of disease. So this is a conceptual model for showing how these abiotic and biotic components interact. And in the world, as a veterinarian who studies populations, this is the perspective we need to understand what drives animal health. And that includes public health, in other words, humans. So this, this is a very important thing to keep in mind when we're trying to have applied research that makes differences when it comes to policy. And, and so we always wanna have this one health perspective where we appreciate these various factors that can determine whether a population is uh, diseased or, or not at a significant level. So One Health, Marine Perspectives, health of coastal humans is intimately tied to the health of the marine environment. That's what we said at the beginning. This is about the North Pacific along the west coast of North America. There are millions and millions of people that live along that coast with very important relationships with the marine environment. We also need to know many of these marine animals share the same resources with humans, for instance, eating the same prey. And uh, some of the animals we study are actually used for food um, by people. So that's how they become defined as sentinels. Sentinel species. A sentry, any watcher or guard. So this slide has a guard tower to sort of point out how one would monitor an area. So that's what sentinel means, a watcher or guard. Some may be familiar with a canary in the coal mine, that the canaries were more sensitive to certain gases, including carbon monoxide. And if the canary went unconscious, then the miners knew it was time to leave. So that was a sentinel. They would take the bird into the 
into the underground mines with them. Another one related to Mercury, which we'll be talking about Mercury a little bit, were the dancing cats of Minamata. Minamata Bay had a, a terrible exposure to mercury that resulted in severe disease of people, as you can see there on the right. Initially, they noticed the cats were dancing, but really that was a neurological impairment. In other words, their nerves were damaged. And so the cats were showing that there was high mercury content in the seafood because people in Minamata Bay were feeding their cats fish. So the cats acted as a sentinel to point to what the problem could be when they saw these uh, outbreaks of disease in people. And it turned out to be a mercury uh, issue for Minamata Bay, which has now been the example that many people use for why we need to better study and better understand uh, mercury in the marine and aquatic environment. So why use marine mammals as sentinels for ecosystems? We'll use our Alaska example, uh, where we use seals, sea lions, and whales, and fish. And in this case, we're going to look at a pinniped as an example. Marine mammals are top predators. Um, I can't see my slide very well, just a second. Uh, there we go. Now I can minimize myself. Uh, marine mammals are often top predators, and these aggregate numerous food webs. So they, they can act as a sentinel because they represent the ecosystem. And so that's really important from the primary production all the way up to a, a top predator. And people along the coast rely on these resources. So that's how they uh, represent the human exposure is that they are consuming similar species if not the same exact species. Why did this become an issue? We were doing uh, sentinel work with stellar sea lions, a very large pinniped that inhabits um, North America all the way over to Asia. In particular, along the Aleutian Islands. For some reason, there's very high mercury levels where these arrows are pointing on the Aleutian Islands of Alaska. So we did not expect to see these very high concentrations, but over many, many years, we have documented them and they continue to increase. Many agencies are interested in what's going on in the Western Aleutian Islands, which we did not know about unless we were doing the sentinel work. So we were doing surveillance that's now resulted in research, many, many research projects as people are curious and concerned about what is resulting in high mercury concentrations in this very specific region. They're useful as sentinels because they're long lived. We'll talk about that related to bioaccumulation and their large body size uh, makes sampling relatively easily. So when it comes to mercury, we need to appreciate that there's a form of mercury called monomethyl mercury that is what's responsible for the exposure. This is what's easily absorbed from the diet. The monomethyl mercury can vary by geographic location and by trophic position. And we're going to emphasize trophic position in this, in this talk, to talk, where we have to understand the biology and ecology to fully appreciate what's happening. So studying these sentinels is complicated. And we've now been working on this over a decade uh, as a One Health research project. And we've also have other species we're now including in this research. When it comes to the stellar sea lions, you have to consider age, male or female, the tissue type you're studying. We often look at hair and blood but we can look at other tissues too. So the tissue type is important to understand. Again, the chemical forms of mercury and the differences among regions. So you can see that this takes a variety of disciplines to properly integrate the biology and ecology for toxicologists uh, like myself. So it is very interdisciplinary and has to use very strong science in all these areas. So mercury in the environment, we need to remember mercury comes from what we like to say anthropogenic, which means human derived. 
for example, like this power plant. And then also volcanoes, there are natural sources of mercury. So we can't determine sources very easily when you have all of these going on in one area. Interestingly, in the Western Aleutians, there's very little known anthropogenic sources. So this is very perplexing as to what might be going on in the Western Aleutian Islands. The sources of the mercury and the, and the reason for the increase is still eluding us. Uh, so we have not yet figured it out, but that is not our only interest. We're also interested in how mercury is uh, affecting the animals and how it's moving through the food web. So this brings us to two very important principles about the kind of work we do in Baja California Sur, California, and in Alaska. It's bioaccumulation and biomagnification. When we use the term bioaccumulation, we refer to the time that a species is alive to accumulate mercury. So this is trying to depict as animals get larger or become older, they have higher levels of mercury. So that is independent of where they feed on the food web. So this is all about time and accumulation over time where mercury increases. Below, biomagnification is about trophic level, that if an organism feeds higher in the food web, higher trophic level, they'll be exposed to higher amounts of mercury in their food. The thing to remember is these occur concurrently or at the same time. So hopefully you understand that we have to assess bioaccumulation and biomagnification but they occur at the same time. They're both impacting how animals will ultimately have mercury concentrations in their tissue. So we, we need to keep that in mind. So the other thing is there's a mercury cycle that I will not go over, but this is to again emphasize there's human derived and natural sources of mercury. And that when these mercury when this mercury is introduced to the ecosystem, it doesn't automatically enter the food web. So we have inorganic mercury produced as a gas or discharged into water. There's a global distribution. It goes into the air as well as directly discharged into the water. This is the key step for us, methylation. Number four, we need to have the mercury methylated so that it enters the food web. Monomethyl mercury is highly bioavailable. Bioavailable means easily absorbed, and it enters the food web. And then the food chain supply there also implicates humans. Humans uh, remove many types of marine organisms from the ocean for food. And of course, that means that's a likely uh, pathway for mercury exposure. So just wanted you to know that just because mercury gets into the air or in the water, it doesn't necessarily enter the food web easily. It has to be methylated. That's a very important step. So again, bioaccumulation, biomagnification. This is why we have to do the basic biology of the animals we study, whether they're shark, pike, albacore, halibut, and biomagnification as we go from krill to those large species I just mentioned. So feeding ecology matters. So we have to understand the individual animal based on its biology and its feeding. The other thing I wanted to point out that biochemistry and physiologists are important in this too. We need to understand how these move through an animal. And in other words, how do they get absorbed and move to certain tissues? For many of these, they are using existing nutrient pathways. For monomethyl mercury, it actually hitches a ride on amino acids that actually mimic other amino acids. So hopefully you understand that by, I've highlighted there where the mercury attaches to an amino acid and then the amino acid that it mimics. So this is physiology and biochemistry that shows how mercury is uh, absorbed and distributes to tissues. It's based on mimicking amino acids. 
just to drive home the point that the mimicry is important for some contaminants you may have heard they're lipophilic they love fat like pcbs ddt and so on this is a very different mechanism it has to do with them being hydrophobic in other words they hate or fear water so these chemicals do not dissolve well in water so they're going to partition into low water environments like fat, adipose, and brain. This relates to the physical chemistry of the agents, but they're still following nutrient pathways as to how certain fats and lipids move around an organism. So they follow the fats, which are nutrients. So just want to drive home the biochemistry and physiology of this is important because it might dictate what tissues you will sample and also the target tissues for looking at adverse effects. Another biological thing we have to consider is sexual dimorphism. And here we're trying to relate this to the work on elasmobranchs in Baja California Sur. This shows females growing larger and faster than males. And that as they get larger, they can consume larger fish. Hopefully you see that by the fish they're, they're exploiting. And that means as they get larger and older, they're bioaccumulating. But again, remember I said at the same time, they may be eating higher on a trophic level as they get larger. So therefore, more biomagnification. And for many of the mammals and fish we study, they are sexually dimorphic. In other words, males and females will be of different sizes or grow at different rates. So again, you really need to understand the basic biology of the animals you're studying to understand how something like gender, sex, would drive uh, differences in their exposure. So this is important in a lot of fish we study in Alaska and in Baja California, sir. So to understand feeding ecology, we do something called stable isotopes analysis for carbon, nitrogen, and sulfur. This has been very important for us to piece together the food webs and talk about how mercury flows to those food webs. I do not want to turn this into a stable isotopes lecture. Uh, so we'll just give some general ideas as how we use these. Using the C13, C12 ratio, those two stable isotopes, we can look at location of dietary resources. Pelagic versus benthic would be very useful here in our marine example. The N15 to N14 ratio was very powerful in establishing trophic position. Again, another feeding ecology tool. The use of S34 over S32 is, shows enrichment of marine environments with S34. So this helps us discriminate between terrestrial versus marine, which is very important along the coast and estuaries. So, how do we use this? We, for example, we can plot the N15 ratio with the C13 ratio and a domestic example of the cat as a top predator. So this is how it would appear uh, if we were to sample a cat that eats rodents and the rodents eat uh, insects. And of course, insects would be eating the primary producers. The value of the C13 over uh, ratio is we can distinguish pelagic versus benthic when we talk about our marine species. And we've used this in Baja California, sir, with some of our studies. For some of the terrestrial things, like when we talk about human uh, subjects work, we can differentiate the plants that they use. For example, the C4 plants like corn have a very different carbon stable isotope signature than some of the other plants. And you'll see how this plays out for humans. So just as an example, um, we put together an Arctic food web using these stable isotopes. And if you look at the very top there, you see the polar bear. And of course, towards the bottom, we see zooplankton and amphipods. And in the middle, like bowhead whale and some of the cephalopods and herring, they're intermediate, they're, they're feeding mostly on invertebrates. So we put this together so we could better understand how contaminants move through the food web and uh, 
we were able to actually calculate the actual trophic level they feed at based on these uh, nitrogen stable isotopes. So then we applied it to total mercury levels in liver. Please note the logarithmic scale. This is on a log scale. Prey are gonna be lower than 15 per mil, and the predators will be higher. And you can see that the total mercury increased uh, across the food web. And this was very important for people of Northern Alaska who rely on many of these animals uh, for food. So this, this is why we use these feeding ecology tools is to put together the food webs based on chemistry. And uh, it is a very powerful tool. Lobos marinos, sea wolves. Uh, we did a study uh, where we did not expect to have such a strong influence of uh, marine environment on uh, gray wolves in Alaska. After we did the chemistry, it became very apparent that what you see here is a wolf with a sea otter that it's gonna consume. So when we did the study, the sulfur isotopes tell us um, marine versus terrestrial. And so with the enriched uh, sulfur, which is on the right, hopefully you can see my pointer, um, this made a clear distinction between marine feeding wolves and terrestrial feeding wolves. Th this shows the power of these stable isotopes. So this showed that these wolves were definitely consuming marine resources, which surprised some of the biologists, the uh, level of dependence on the marine environment the wolves had. But after they saw these data, investigated observations of wolves preying on um, marine resources, it became clear uh, these coastal wolf populations do use marine sources as well as terrestrial resources. What did that mean for mercury? They had much higher mercury levels, as you can see here in the red box. So they, were, they had very high S34 values, and they were the ones with the highest mercury concentrations. This was a very dramatic example, of the stabilized topes of sulfur helping us explain the mercury concentrations in these wolves. So very important um, to help distinguish uh, what portions of the ecosystem uh, predators are exploiting. All right. Now, working with Sibnor and CCMAR on elasmobranchs, we found uh, very high mercury concentrations in muscle that led to a One Health approach to use these tools that I just discussed, but now on human consumers. We've also used these tools on Alaska human subjects, but I won't present that here. They worked very well in Alaska too. So you're all familiar with Baja California, sir. Want to remember that we do research for marine vegans and vegetarians too. We don't want to just say it's all about meat eating because uh, the bioaccumulation and biomagnification starts at the very beginning of the food web. So here we looked at trace elements in macroalgae and also in sea urchins. So don't want to uh, exclude the lower portions of the food web because that lower portion of the food web is actually where a great deal of magnification occurs, going from water to primary producers, to herbivores. So it's important to recognize these are also important in the magnification of some contaminants in the food web. So we, I wanted to make sure we made that point. When we looked at blue sharks, we were looking at shark physiology and health uh, with Sibnor and CC Monitor. And the shark sentinel, the blue shark, indicated relatively high mercury concentrations, just like stellar sea lions in Alaska. So this was a good, great PhD project for Angie, and it also got us on a path of studying mercury in a One Health perspective because the blue shark turned out to be an important sentinel. So Dr. Maria Cisneros did her PhD project uh, looking at other elasmobranchs and a kind of a fun uh, thing that John Harley did there was bat ray, shovel nose guitar fish, 
banded guitar fish were the target species. So again, we looked at mussel and we found that there was sexual dimorphism and it in, immature and mature mattered. So if you look at the solid lines for those three species, those are the immature females and males. The dashed lines are the mature males and females. Well, you can see their sexual dimorphism and variations in total mercury concentration. So once again, we're back to looking at uh, maturity or size and differences in mercury concentrations based on, on those. So it's very important to recognize mercury concentrations within a species are not constant or consistent. It depends on age, size, and sex. So if we're gonna give consumption advice in Alaska or Mexico, you really need to understand which portions of that species, the cohorts like males or females, and their age and size are important to distinguish. Hopefully it makes sense that the smaller immature species have lower concentrations and may not be of concern. And then the next slide here is just showing liver. Muscle would probably be the most important one for human exposure. So we started off with two studies that ended up as companion papers and toxicology reports where we had to emphasize humans are marine mammals. I say that in Alaska and I say that in Baja California, sir, because chemically speaking, these humans who eat fish and rely on marine resources, they are chemically marine. So we have to think about them as marine mammals. Because mercury affects the fetus and the neonate, we, uh, Dr. Ramon Garcia Robles decided we should focus on pregnant women, which was a very good idea. And so we did these two um, studies to look at the same feeding ecology tools, looking at mercury concentrations in their hair. But in this case, we could actually take a survey of what they ate. Obviously we can't take surveys from the animals. Uh, we depend on the chemistry. But here we did a mixture of things to uh, represent the diet. So we're gonna look at the range of mercury concentrations in hair that's related to the exposure. We did the fish consumption survey. And again, we're gonna use some of those stable isotope tools to look at trophic level or chemical feeding ecology. It's the same tools we used in the fish and wildlife. We almost studied 100 women, and we ended up with a very wide range of mercury concentrations, as high as 90 micrograms per gram in hair. The range of concerns for humans, depending on what country or agency it is, is one to 10. So you can see uh, we're in the range of concern with the mean, and we exceeded 10 for some individuals. And so this uh, was, something we felt should be further evaluated. So we found that individuals who were enriched with N15, remember higher trophic level, had higher total mercury concentrations. This also fit with the surveys where we found those people reported eating more fish. Again, it makes sense because they're feeding at a higher trophic level. So here's the data, the bars, represent total mercury. And you can see that increases as people eat more fish, but it also increases as their stable isotopes of N15 increase. So this definitely related the mercury concentrations to how much fish they ate and the trophic level they were feeding at. That last bar there may be a result of a poor sample size, N of seven. And so that may have been poorly representing uh, the population of, of uh, human consumers there. But this clearly showed there was a link with seafood and trophic level for those being exposed to mercury. So we had to do a third study that John Harley, a PhD student from here, worked with people down in uh, Baja California, Sur, 
we, this required further follow-up. So we included more women and more food items. And this time we decided to also analyze for methylmercury. This was a little bit more complicated because this required modeling and we needed the appropriate colleagues for the modeling as well. So um, I'm not gonna go into details on this, but just give you the general ideas of how this worked. What are the sources of mercury? Well, we decided we needed to go beyond fish and seafood because actually, as you probably know, people eat a lot of rice, beans, and flour. Even though that may not have a lot of mercury in it, because it's so frequently consumed, maybe even a moderate amount of mercury could lead to exposure. So we included um, staple foods. Non-dietary, yes. There's a variety of whitening creams and hair products that actually have mercury in them. Not monomethyl mercury, but it is something that can cause uh, higher concentrations uh, that's non-dietary. Dental amalgams. These are the fillings in the teeth. We actually showed that some people in this study, their mercury concentrations were probably related to recent dental amalgams, that is recent fillings in their teeth. I'm not gonna go over that here, but when it comes to people, you need to recognize there's a lot of exposure pathways that we have to consider that don't exist for uh, marine mammals or marine fish. So we've got rice, beans, flour, tortillas. We got fish from the markets to expand the species we looked at. We had more human hair samples. Well, as expected, this table shows total mercury and methylmercury values. The important thing here is we can now say that most of the total mercury we measure is actually monomethylmercury. That was important to document. And you can see that going from clams to mahara, we have a large range in total mercury concentrations in the food items. And at 200 parts per billion, some people would consider as a cutoff or level of concern. And we can see that the mohara were at that level of concern. So we definitely documented that there was a greater range of mercury concentrations in the foods, marine foods that people use in Baja California Sur. This slide is using the stable isotopes to group these food items. So you can see on the lower left, rice, beans, and flour, low nitrogen, low N15, low C13. And then the fish and seafood, as expected, have higher N15, higher C13. And there's corn. Remember I told you corn really stands out because of its photosynthetic mechanisms and the carbon stable isotopes. There's human hair right in the middle. So you can use modeling to show what humans are consuming based on these stable isotope signatures. And so this is a very helpful tool in using these mixing models. And there's a variety of models that we use uh, to put this together. And again, I don't wanna go into the details of it, but uh, they worked very hard. The co-authors on this worked very hard on using these models. And here's what they came up with. Lots of corn, lots of rice, a little bean and flour in the diet, and there's a seafood signature over here with fish, fish and seafood. So to help summarize this to, related to our findings, we had to talk about these staple foods, which were very, very low in methylmercury concentrations it was actually below the level of detection for total mercury analysis. So we relied on monomethylmercury analysis. And you can see for beans, it was even below detection level. And for methylmercury and rice, it was very, very low. So we, we confirmed that the mercury in stable isotopes was very low and unlikely contributing to what we were seeing in uh, the pregnant women and that it was probably related to seafood consumption. So people eat a lot of corn and rice and some beans and flour, and that was based on looking at the carbon intake. So overall, there was not a great marine input with, with respect to carbon because people depend 
on these uh, corn and rice based foods. However, mercury exposure was definitely related to marine input based on nitrogen. It is the most important driver. So it confirmed the previous work that mercury exposure is based on the use of marine resources. So Dr. Mario Cisneros followed up with a study that's recently published where we're combining data sets and adding new analyses. Please remember this does not include elasmobranchs to the level that we saw in the previous studies. She showed that fish total mercury varies by length, weight, and trophic ecology. This again validated previous findings. So this means if we ever were going to give consumption advice, it would be for certain sexes and certain lengths of fish because of what we found based on the variability of total mercury in those fish. So we wanna be very careful about saying a species is high in mercury because it may only be certain individuals based on their age and sex that might be high in mercury. She also did the hazard quotients for this, which is a mechanism for saying how risky is consuming that fish. And many were below one, and that meant that they're relatively safe. So relative uh, risk of mercury toxicosis is low, uh, but again, we probably should uh, focus more on elasmobranchs to make those assessments. But overall, what's coming from the market showed relatively low hazard quotients and are, are safe. Here's a plot from her paper, just sort of showing again how the stable isotopes help us put together the, the feeding ecology of these fish and the trophic levels, uh, like for N15 on the right. So again, trophic level matters, and uh, these are important considerations as we try to put together mercury flowing through the food web and ultimately to people. So in conclusion, the pathways of exposure are not always obvious. Marine and terrestrial organisms exposure pathways can be better understood through use of stable isotopes of carbon, nitrogen, sulfur. Mercury is of concern for many fish consumers along the west coast of North America. This is Barrow to Baja. Uh, in particular, it's maternal exposure, whether we're studying sea lions or people, uh, or sharks, it's maternal exposure that is probably one of the keys. And also I'd like to say it's a great privilege to work with such interesting and wonderful species. And uh, my colleagues in Baja California, sir, have been wonderful. And uh, it's a great privilege to be invited to talk to you and, and to show some of the great work we've done together. In the end, we always like to end with this, fish consumption. There are many benefits that have to be compared to potential risks. Many of us feel very strongly in Alaska that the benefits still greatly outweigh any of the risks associated with the contaminants we study. Now, there are parts of the world where the risks are relatively high, but uh, again, you need to balance all this with the benefits, and those are the known benefits right there uh, for people eating fish. Thank you very much. Muchísimas gracias, doctor Todd O'Hara. Gracias. A continuación, me permito darle la bienvenida a la coordinadora de la sesión de preguntas y respuestas, la doctora Daniela Murillo Cisneros. Muchas gracias, doctora Murillo. Adelante, por favor, ya está abierto nuestro chat virtual. Muchas gracias, Tony. Este, agradecemos al doctor O'Hara por su presentación. Uh, si hay alguna pregunta, duda, comentario, por favor, ya sea en el chat o alzando la mano. Comentarios. There's a question. Someone has their hands up. Do you see that, Hani? Yeah. Jaime Gómez tiene una pregunta. Tiene en mute su audio. A ver. Ya. Yeah. Ya. Yeah. Este. Ah, oh, great talk that you had. Uh, I have a question. If you have been measuring mercury in uh, tuna can, because, well, a, a lot of Mexican people eat tuna from uh, can it uh, style, you know? Um, I wonder what could be the potential problem by lead 
uh, I mean, uh, gasoline, gasoline and on other uh, products produce a lot of, of, of lead. Is this a potential problem, uh, or perhaps higher than mercury? Um, I had, your voice was breaking up. So you asked about tuna? Tuna can. Yes, the, the tuna have the same range of mercury concentrations where some tuna are higher than others. And in some of the work we've done in Alaska, we've actually gone into the stores and also purchased food that people eat in combination with their locally caught foods. We didn't do that so much in Baja California Sur because people depended so much on the fish market that relied on local caught fish. But you're right, in some situations, like in the study in Alaska, we had to account for store-bought fish as well as fish that were locally caught. I believe that's the point you were trying to make. Continuamos. And then related to lead and gasoline, uh, lead was used in paints, gasoline, and other products that have now contam permanently contaminated the environment in some places. It's less of a problem now for what's in the air, but areas have been contam contaminated by lead paint, lead gasoline, and that's still a concern for exposure in children because children don't wash their hands and they put things in their mouth that comes from the environment that could have uh, lead contaminated dust. And that's still a problem around the world, uh, including modern countries that usually try to clean up after those types of events. So yes, lead continues to be a problem and use of lead in fishing and hunting is something we're still working on because it's still results in exposure of people and, uh, and uh, scavengers. Up north, uh, people who rely on hunting a lot, uh, we're seeing that their exposure levels to lead have shifted from being gasoline to being from uh, use of uh, lead ammunition. Does that help answer that? Thank you, Dr. Aljara. Uh, Tenemos tiempo para un comentario, una pregunta más, si alguien tiene. Uh, tenemos una pregunta de César. We have another question, Todd. Uh, referring to the data that you got in Gray uh, Wolf, do you know uh, adverse effect related to the data obtained? Ah, yes. Um, it's interesting. We did that study because we were looking at something we call the eco toxicoparasitology of mercury exposure. We were looking at wolves and uh, pinnipeds to understand how the parasites in the gut affected mercury absorption. We did not anticipate those high mercury concentrations. And so there were no adverse effects assessments made on those wolves. We were looking at uh, how the parasitology was driving mercury exposure. My theory was that fish eating predators and their parasites have adapted to high mercury concentrations. That did prove to be the case for, for the work we did. So we were unable to go back and look at adverse effects in the wolves, but that did come up as a point that could these mercury levels be impacting uh, the wolves, especially the pups because of uh, exposure in utero. So yeah, we, we were unable to follow up because we didn't anticipate the high mercury concentration. So that was a good question and we contemplated it. Yes. Thank you very much, Dr. Ojara. Um, esto sería todo para preguntas. Si tienen algunas preguntas o comentarios pendientes, podemos, se pueden mandar a la coordinación de posgrados y se las haremos llegar al doctor Ojara, las cuales serán um, respondidas y devueltas a ustedes. Muchas, muchísimas gracias. Doctor Arjarias, thank you very much. Al contrario, muchas gracias, doctora Daniela Murillo Cisneros, por su puntual participación. 
A continuación, se dará lectura al reconocimiento del doctor Toto Jara por parte de la doctora Gracia Gómez Anduro, directora de Estudios de Posgrado y Formación de Recursos Humanos del CIPNOR. Doctora Gracia, adelante, por favor. Adiós, amigos. It was fun. No, no, no. no. You have to stay for your recognition. Oh, lo siento. <laughs> doctora Gracia Gómez, solicitamos su valiosa participación. Eh, el audio dice que no lo dejan a mí. No sé, maestro Jorge Corins, ¿nos puedes apoyar? A ver, tiene algún problema. Vamos a ver. Hola, muchas gracias. Thank you so much, doctor Todo Jara. Thank you for your presentation, doctor. And we are really appreciate your participation here. And I will read the certificate or recognize uh, the certificate, but it's in Spanish. <laughs> el comité organizador de la semana de posgrado damos, eh, otorgamos el presente reconocimiento al doctor Todd O'Hara por su conferencia magistrat Salud Integral en Baja California Sur el 26 de abril del 2022. Muchas gracias. <laughs> 